So for the next 35 minutes, I'll talk a little bit about MRI of the knee. And our outline for this morning, uh, the first half will be about the menisci, the normal anatomy, diagnosing tears in the post-operative meniscus. And the second half, we'll talk about patterns of injury, the commonly injured structures, specific injuries, and post-operative ACL. So as far as the menisci goes, identification of meniscal tears remains the primary indication for MRI of the knee. It's more accurate than physical examination. It can influence in, uh, clinical practice by allowing one to avoid unnecessary arthroscopy and by allowing the radiologist to identify alternative diagnoses. Now, the menisci are largely composed of fibrocartilage, which has few mobile protons, and therefore they're going to appear dark on all MR sequences. The meniscal body has this so-called bow, bow tie shaped on uh, sagittal images as typically seen on only the outer two sagittal slices, assuming you have about a four millimeter slice thickness. Meniscal horns, on the other hand, you have two triangles with facing apices on sagittal images. The width in general is greater than the height. And there are a couple of rules you should be aware of. For the medial meniscus, the posterior horn is larger than the anterior horn. And for the lateral meniscus, the horns are about of equal size. Now, there are two MRI criteria for diagnosing a meniscal tear, assuming there's been no prior meniscal surgery. Criteria number one is intrameniscal signal that unequivocally contacts the articular surface of a meniscus on a short TE, for example, a proton density weighted image. And criteria number two is abnormal meniscal morphology. So let's look at these criteria individually. When internal signal contacts a meniscal surface on two or more images, the meniscus is gonna to be torn in arthroscopy more than 90% of the time. But if the signal only touches the surface on one image, then about 55% of medial uh, signal abnormalities and 30% of lateral signal abnormalities represent true tears. And I sometimes use these uh, figures in my reports just to give it some sort of air of scientific validity. Uh, seeing the tear in both the sagittal and coronal planes will increase the likelihood that the tear is a true tear. Now, any contour defect or fragmentation in the meniscus without prior surgery is also abnormal. Common tear patterns are gonna include amputation of the point of the triangle or just foreshortening of the entire triangle. It is important to know how to describe meniscal tears. Uh, you can divide them uh, grossly into horizontal tears, which tend to be degenerative in etiology, vertical tears, which are traumatic and be subdivided into longitudinal and radial tears, and complex tears, which are tears with both horizontal and vertical components. So horizontal tears, follow acute trauma to a degenerated meniscus. They typically occur in older patients and the trauma is often relatively minor, for example, after squatting or climbing stairs. And here's a nice example of a horizontal tear, parallels the femoral articular surface but extends to the tibial articular surface. Longitudinal tears are a type of vertical tear that uh, run parallel to the curvature of the meniscus. And the key to recognizing these is that the distance between the base of the meniscus and the point uh, which the tear contacts the articular surface remains the same on sequential sagittal images like you see here. So here's an example of a longitudinal tear of the posterior horn. You can see here it is on this slice. You go to the next slice over, hasn't changed really in orientation. One more slice, you see, see it again. It's the same distance from the base of meniscus on all slices, so it's paralleling that curvature. That's a longitudinal tear. A radial tears are perpendicular to the curvature, and they involve the free edge or inner edge of the meniscus. And in this case, the inner point of the meniscal triangle is gonna be absent or blunted on sagittal images. Here you have an example of normal anterior horn, abnormal posterior horn that appears blunted because there's a radial tear. Often these gonna propagate um, further peripherally, and you'll see this column of abnormal signal that may even extend into the body. Uh, every now and then, you'll see uh, the tear actually on an axial image. And if, you're, if your plane of imaging happens to parallel uh, the tear, you might get this so-called ghosting phenomenon where the meniscus suddenly becomes gray and then our next image will be nice and black. So just keep that in mind. You wanna look at all your uh, planes, axial, coronal, and sagittal for these tears. The most common acute traumatic tear affects the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. It's often complex and branching as we see here. Uh, but in patients with acute ACL disruption, lateral meniscal tears actually outnumber medial meniscal tears. And even in patients with combined ACL and MCL injuries, lateral meniscal tears are still gonna be actually more common than the medial ones. Now, meniscal tears can be either stable or they can be unstable. In general, knees with unstable meniscal tears are gonna do poorly if these tears aren't treated because it's gonna lead to premature osteoarthritis. The stability or instability of a tear is determined by a variety of factors, including its length, its location, and its completeness. Now, what do I mean by completeness? Well, longitudinal tears are called complete if the tear extends to both the superior and inferior articular margins of the meniscus or when you see a displaced meniscal fragment. 
A complete radial tear extends the full width of the meniscus from the free edge to the periphery. And these are really devastating injury because it essentially uh, renders the meniscus useless to distribute a load. It is important to document to which <clears throat> surface or surfaces the tear extends. That will determine whether it's a partial or a complete tear. And it will also uh, let the orthopedic surgeon know that the, there might be an inferior surface tear. You really want to mention these because uh, they may be poorly visualized in this unless the uh, arthroscopist specifically goes in there and looks for them. Other examples of unstable tears include any tear with a displaced fragment on MRI, most tears with a complex shape, and longitudinal tears that are relatively large that are seen on at least maybe three or four uh, sections, sagittal sections, either in the coronal or sagittal or coronal plane, or if they contain fluid and signal intensity on T2-weighted images. That means that the tear is actually big enough to allow fluid to get into it. Uh, bucket handle tear, very common boards case for those of the senior residents in here. It's a type of longitudinal tear with a displaced inner fragment. More commonly affects the medial meniscus on MRI. There are several signs you should look for. Uh, you can have a displaced inner fragment within the intercontinular notch, so-called double PCL sign. The anterior horn can appear abnormally large due to a posterior horn fragment that is flipped anteriorly. It's called a flip meniscal sign or pseudohypertrophy of the anterior horn. And you can have too few bow ties because of disruption of the body. These bucket handle tears are going to require surgery because they're going to result in mechanical knee locking. So here's an example of a bucket handle tear. We'll start from, um, from the outer sagittal slice and work our way toward the intercondylar notch. And the first thing you notice is there's really not much of a body here. And then on the next slice over, you see something abnormal. You see that the anterior horn is much bigger than the posterior horn. We said that the posterior horn should be bigger than the anterior horn. And if you go next slice over, you start to see why, that maybe there are in fact two little uh, uh, anterior horns here, which of course there shouldn't be, and in fact it starts to resolve itself right here, and go inward a little bit more, you see the classic double PCL sign, um, normal PCL here, and then the flip fragment in the intercondylar notch, making a second PCL. Some pitfalls you should be aware of in children, you can normally see signal in the periphery of the meniscus. Um, these are due to perforating vessels, but it should not contact the articular surface. An older patient, you can see abnormal signal confined within the meniscus that corresponds histologically to just degeneration, mucoid and mucinous degeneration. And in the el elderly, even signal that does contact the meniscal surface, quite honestly, may simply represent severe degeneration, especially if it looks really globular like this. Some other pitfalls falls I want to talk about uh, have to do with uh, normal anatomy. And there are a bunch of different pitfalls, but the ones I want to talk about uh, specifically are popliteus tendon, meniscal femoral ligaments, and transverse meniscal ligaments, which can all mimic tears of the lateral meniscus. There are a bunch of other uh, pitfalls as well, that uh, some of which are in your handout, um, particularly blending of the ACL fibers with the anterior root of the lateral meniscus. You can also get magic angle phenomenon, volume averaging, chondrocalcinosis, and uh, some other uh, less common ones as well. The tendon of the popliteus muscle can mimic a tear on occasion. The muscle originates along the posterior aspect of the proximal tibia, and it sends its tendon around the uh, corner of the uh, posterior lateral corner of the lateral meniscus and inserts on the um, femoral condyle. And this can be mistaken for a meniscal fragment. If you imagine you take a sagittal slice through the meniscus, which is here, and it also catches some of this popliteus tendon, uh, it may look like a tear. For example, if you were to assume that this whole structure back here represented meniscus, then you'd have to call this band right here a tear. But in fact, this represents simply the popliteus tendon, and you can follow it down, down, and see that it is part of that popliteus muscle. Meniscal femoral ligaments attach to the posterior horn of the medial meniscus and extend up to, excuse me, lateral meniscus and extend up to the medial femoral condyle. Uh, there are two of them that you'll commonly see, Humphrey if it's anterior to the PCL, and Risberg if it's posterior to the PCL. Uh, again, the takeoff of this ligament from the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus can mimic a tear. Uh, this certainly offhand looks like a tear of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus near its root, but if you keep following it, you see it's really just the takeoff of that ligament, and this must be a ligament of Humphrey since it's anterior to the PCL, and you can generally keep following it all the way up to the uh, medial femoral condyle. Transverse meniscal ligaments, very common. It attaches the anterior horns of the lateral and medial meniscus in about 40% of patients. Uh, and the attachment of the, uh, to the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus, the lateral meniscus may, may simulate a tear. It's interestingly enough, rarely, rarely a problem on the medial side. But uh, here you see a nice example of the transverse meniscal ligament. 
And uh, this person does have a tear. This is actually the case I showed you earlier of a longitudinal tear. But look at this right here. You'd think there maybe there's an anterior uh, horn tear as well. But if you follow that little dot, you see it's really just that transverse meniscal ligament. And there it is inserting into the anterior horn of the medial meniscus. Now, as far as these meniscal injuries go, uh, the decision of whether or not you're going to treat one depends on many factors, including the patient's age, what he does with his life, and features of the tear itself. But the options overall are observation, repair, and partial meniscectomy. Complete meniscectomies are really rarely done today because they just lead to premature osteoarthritis. So you might choose to observe a tear if a tear is short and stable in the uh, uh, partial thickness tear in the vascularized periphery. If you're to divide the meniscus into thirds, it's the only the peripheral third that's vascularized, and that's the area that's going to tend to heal or that can be repaired with sutures. And the goal, though, with these, these short, stable tears in the vascularized periphery is maybe they'll just spontaneously heal, particularly if they're just partial thickness. If it's a little more complex looking, like you see here, but it's still in that vascularized periphery, then the orthopedic surgeon may choose to repair these tears, particularly if it's greater than a centimeter in length and there's no significant degeneration in the remaining meniscus. And the goal here, again, is to stabilize the fragments to restore the original meniscal morphology such that the tear can then heal on its own, but with the help of sutures. Here's a nice example. It looks like a bucket handle tear of the lateral meniscus, uh, and they decide to go and just repair it with sutures, and it looks practically as good as new. Partial meniscectomies can be done. This person here had a partial meniscectomy. Uh, these are for tears that are not observable or repairable, essentially, particularly those that are in the central two-thirds or central half of the meniscus near the free edge. The goal here is to remove as little meniscal tissue as possible, meaning the unstable fragment, and to maintain the meniscoid shape and avoid any sort of sharp edges. So here's a person who's status post partial meniscectomy, but it's, it's fairly difficult to tell um, that the, the patient had any meniscal surgery. The menisci look pretty normal. So what can we do for about the postoperative meniscus and imaging it? Well, like we said, there are two MRI criteria for diagnosing a tear in a virgin meniscus. Criteria number one is intrameniscal signal that unequivocally contacts the articular surface of meniscus on a short TE image. Criteria number two is abnormal meniscal morphology. But these criteria have to be used with extreme caution in someone who's had repair or uh, surgery on their meniscus. So let's look at these criteria again individually. Uh, criteria number one, intrameniscal signal that unequivocally contacts an articular surface of meniscus on a short TE image. In the postoperative meniscus, this is still quite a sensitive indicator for a meniscal tear. Unfortunately, it's no longer specific unless you see new signal that's contacting the meniscal surface at a site other than that of the original tear. It just means you have a new tear that you didn't see before. Um, but there's some problems. Menisci with tears that are being observed or that have been repaired, for example, a healing tear like I showed you earlier, they can have this signal for years. And so if, if you were to see this and you didn't know that this person had a meniscal repair, you would certainly call that a tear. But it might just be a tear that has been healed for quite some time. The other problem is if the patient undergoes a partial meniscectomy, the resected fragment of the torn meniscus often doesn't contain the entire linear area of abnormal signal intensity. So I made this little schematic up here. Here's a meniscus. The white part represents a tear. The gray part represents a little degeneration adjacent to the tear. What the orthopedic surgeon's going to do is he's going to go in and take out all this meniscal fragment that includes the tear and leave this. Well, unfortunately, now you've left some degenerative signal that goes to the articular surface, which looks like a tear. So that can be problematic. It doesn't show up very well. Usually it looks very kind of... Uh, um, ill-defined like it does here, just a little bit of signal right adjacent to the um, articular surface. Criteria number two, abnormal meniscal morphology. Well, in the postoperative meniscus, if you've had a lot of meniscus resected, you should be expecting some sort of contour deformity, but you should never see a sudden change in meniscal contour, in other words, a sharp edge, and you shouldn't see any free fragments. If less than 25% of the meniscus has been removed, a lot of times you won't see any abnormalities. They'll just look normal. So here's a very attenuated meniscus following meniscectomy, but it maintains a relative meniscoid uh, shape, and that turns out just to be a normal postoperative meniscus. Here, on the other hand, this doesn't really maintain a meniscoid shape. It's close, but it has this sort of jagged edge right here. And this was a tear after meniscectomy. So look for those kind of jagged edges. So what are some new criteria? Or criteria for new tears or re-tears? Well, if you have internal signal contacting the meniscal surface on a proton density weighted image at a site other than the repair site, well, then you can call that a new tear. If you have a sudden change in meniscal contour, like sharp edge, like I showed you earlier, displaced meniscal fragment, you can call that a tear. 
If you see internal fluid signal contacting meniscal surface on a T2 weighted image, in other words, you have joint fluid entering the tear, that's fairly uncommon, but you can see it, and that will certainly indicate a tear. You shouldn't have that even with a healing tear. And if you have intrameniscal contrast after an arthrogram, in other words, gadolinium entering, entering the tear, then you can certainly call that as well. So here's a tear post-meniscectomy. Well, what do we say about this? Well, the anterior horn doesn't look too, too hot, but we're focusing on the posterior horn here. It looks like there's this little bit of signal abnormality right there. Well, is that a tear? Is it just a healing tear? What's going on? Well, you look at the T2-weighted image, and sure enough, some of that signals fluid signal intensity going in there. That's abnormal. That's a true tear. Here's another one. You can barely see the meniscus here. Is it all degeneration? What's going on? Well, you look at the T2-weighted image, and you see these two fragments here separated by this cleft of fluid signal intensity on T2-weighted images. So the T2-weighted images can be very useful in distinguishing if something's truly a, a tear or not a tear. Now, how about this? Do you get conventional MRI or do you do MR arthrography? Well, several studies have shown that MR arthrography improves the accuracy in the diagnosis of tears in postoperative menisci relative to regular MRI, particularly in patients who have had relatively extensive meaning greater than a quarter to a third of their meniscus resected. Uh, if you ha it's thought that increased intraarticular distension is going to force contrast into the tear if you do direct arthrography, and you get more detailed images with greater signal-to-noise ratio with T1-weighted images than you do with T2-weighted images. But other studies, honestly, have shown no significant difference in the accuracy between uh, conventional MRI and MRA. If you choose to do it, you want to inject a fair amount of dilute gadolinium into the knee, up to 40 cc's, uh, into the joint behind the patella. You can use a super patellar tourniquet. Some people think that uh, helps out a little bit. And you can even exercise the knee to kind of slosh the gadolinium around. And then you get your fat-saturated T1-weighted images. I think they can be kind of confusing, honestly, uh, particularly because a lot of times these patients who have meniscal surgery also have like an ACL repair, and then you get all this uh, uh, incomplete fat saturation due to the adjacent metal from screws. Uh, this is one we certainly thought was going to be a, uh, a recurrent meniscal tear. It looks pretty bright. looks like it's probably gadolinium going in there. Nope, it was just a healed tear. Uh, here's another one, a tear pre-repair, and then post-repair. You see there is a little bit of signal going up there, and then we have this very pixely um, image that does show gadolinium going up into, barely up into the uh, uh, posterior horn there. In addition, there was truncation of the triangle of the posterior horn, and that represented not only a, a tear that had uh, uh, hadn't healed, but a new radial tear as well. So me most investigators agree that MRAs or MR arthrography is useful in patients who have undergone relatively extensive partial men meniscectomy, but in all other patients, the opinion really varies. Some advocate MR arthrography in all patients. Others suggest MRI and conventional MRI initially with subsequent uh, arthrography reserved for inconclusive cases. My personal philosophy is I think it's really important to encourage your surgeons to provide the data regarding the type and extent of meniscal surgery. You don't want to assume that a truncated postoperative meniscus is due to meniscectomy because it's going to be abnormal if the patient's meniscus was simply repaired with sutures. It's also important to make every effort to obtain any preoperative MRI studies because you may see that new tear that's remote from the site of the original tear. I personally think the less important is the actual type of study you do, whether you do conventional MRI or MR arthrography. If you can palpate a joint effusion, maybe you can try uh, standard T2-weighted images and not do the MR arthrography. Do you feel more comfortable with one procedure over the other? Well, if so, uh, your personal accuracy may be better with it. If you still can't decide, you can always try MR arthrography. You can still get your routine sequences that you would normally get. There would just be a little more fluid within the joint. I want to move on now and talk about patterns of injury and some of the structures that can be injured. So just a brief review of the anatomy. You have your anterior cruciate ligament, which should be hypo-intense, except at the tibial insertion, where you can have a little interspersed fat. Posteriorly, can also be a little bit uh, less hypo-intense, and in the elderly, you can have degeneration. The slope should be equal to or greater than the intercondylar roof. So here's the slope of the ACL, and here's the intercondylar roof of the uh, femur, so-called Blumensatz line. The PCL is much less commonly injured than the ACL. It has, its fibers are more tightly bound, and therefore it's going to be more uniformly hypo-intense, except at the apex you can get a little bit of uh, increased signal due to that magic angle phenomenon that we referred to earlier. And also in elderly patients, they can undergo a little bit of degeneration. The medial collateral ligament actually has two uh, um, components. There's a superficial band that I like to call the tibial collateral ligament that extends from the medial femoral condyle to the medial tibial metaphyses, sometimes off the field of view of your MRI. And then you have a deep band, which is actually a focal capsular thickening along the middle third of the joint, which is firmly attached to the medial meniscus. And in between the two, uh, there's this little fibrofatty bursa that separates the 
superficial band of the MCL from the deep band of the MCL. And quite honestly, that deep band is pretty hard to visualize. The superficial band, you'll always see, the deep band can be very tough to visualize. The lateral collateral ligament uh, structures uh, and the poster lateral corner, uh, depending on who you read, they will comment on uh, different structures that compose these. But as radiologists, we like to uh, describe what we can see consistently. So anteriorly, you have your iliotibial band that inserts, has uh, several insertions actually, but the main one's down here on Gertie's tubercle of the proximal tibia laterally. Posteriorly, you have your fibular collateral ligament, excuse me, your fibular collateral ligament, your biceps femoris tendon, and your popliteus muscle and tendon. So here's your fibular collateral ligament here. It has a proximal attachment, the lateral femoral condyle comes down distally to form a conjoined attachment with the biceps femoris tendon on the fibular head. Note that this fibular collateral ligament is not attached to the lateral meniscus. Now, injury patterns. I want to spend a little bit of time on this. I like to divide these into valgus injuries, varus injuries, and flexion injuries. And the valgus injuries are ones that are relatively common because uh, you're more likely to get hit from the lateral side of your knee than your medial side. Um, and it needs to be divided into pure valgus, valgus with flexion and external rotation, and valgus and hyperextension. Let's talk about these. We'll start with a very simple one. This is the clipping injury, very common in football players. And this is a normal knee here, but I just want to use it to sort of uh, show you what, uh, what happens. You get hit from the side, okay, lateral side. And what happens then is you get compressive forces here in your lateral compartment. You can imagine that those are going to cause a bone contusion if the bones hit one another. And you get distractive forces here on the lateral side, which can result in a tear of your medial collateral ligament. This is going to be a common theme for the next 10 minutes here. Um, whatever side you have the bone contusions on, look at the opposite side or opposite corner for your soft tissue injury. So here's a clipping injury where you have impactions of the lateral femoral condyle, lateral tibia. Here's your MCL over here, but it stops right there. So you have a full thickness MCL tear. And with increasing degrees of flexion at injury, this can result in ACL and medial meniscal disruption. This is the so-called O'Donohue's triad, which is actually surprisingly pretty rare. Uh, as far as grading MCL injuries, uh, there are three clinical grades, and we try to sort of match them with MRI. Grade one is simply a sprain where you see edema superficial to the MCL. I like using axial images a lot. I think they're underutilized. But here's your MCL here, and you can see a lot of signal around it corresponding to a sprain. Uh, grade two injury is a partial tear. Some of the fibers are intact, but you actually see intrasubstance increased signal within the uh, ligament. Again, on your axial image, you can see your MCL. There's actually some increased signal within the fibers. And then finally, a grade three, which I've shown you already, is complete disruption of the, uh, of the MCL. Now, here's a complicated mechanism of injury, the valgus injury with flexion and external rotation of the tibia. Do you have to remember that? No. But keep in mind that this is the most common injury that we see. It's the so-called pivot shift injury. It's a non-contact injury. It's due to rapid deceleration, simultaneous direction changes, and it's common in skiers and football players. And when I say this is the most common we see, uh, this is the one that usually results in ACL ruptures. Usually the ACL rupture is going to be mid-substance, but can sometimes be at either attachment. And you'll see high signal traversing the ligament, or the ligament will just be, appear overall indistinct, and you may see an abnormal slope. What happens with these patients is at the time of ACL rupture, your tibia moves anteriorly and up, and you get these impactions on the posterior, posterior lateral tibia and the lateral femoral condyle. Very classic bone contusion pattern for ACL injuries and for this particular kind of injury. You can imagine that the more flexed the knee is, the more posterior the contusion is going to be within the lateral femoral condyle, whereas if it's less flexed, you're going to have a more anterior contusion in the lateral femoral condyle. Associated injuries include the medial collateral ligament, as you see here, it's disrupted, the posterior horn of the lateral medial meniscus, and you sometimes get these bruises of the posterior lip of the medial tibial plateau, which is supposed to be a contra thought to be a contra coup injury. Valgus injury with hyperextension is rare, but again, it brings home the point that if you have an anterolateral bone bruise, as you see here, an anterolateral aspect of the tibia, an anterolateral aspect of the uh, femur, you want to look for posteromedial soft tissue injury. And this could include MCL injury, as you see here, because of the valgus forces, and posterior structural injury, such as this PCL tear here, because of hyperextension. You can also get posterior medial corner injuries, such as your semimembranosus tendon and your posterior capsule. Moving on to varus injuries. Uh, varus injuries in general are less common than valgus injuries. Uh, a pure varus injury is particularly uncommon. It's almost exclusively seen in wrestlers. 
Uh, when you get medial impactions of your tibial and femoral condyles, it's kind of the opposite of a clipping injury. And since you have medial bone bruises, you want to look for lateral soft tissue injury. So you'll look at your fibular collateral ligament. It may not show up very well here, but there's abnormal signal in there. Here's another example of a lateral collateral ligament with too much abnormal signal within and without uh, and, and around it. Here's a normal medial collateral ligament here on your axial images. Again, I really like the axial images. And then on this side, you can see the lateral collateral ligament has abnormally high signal within and around it. Here's another complicated one, varus injury with flexion and internal rotation of the tibia. It's very uncommon. Don't have to worry about all this terminology. But keep in mind that this is what causes something you probably have heard of, the second avulsion fracture, which is a little avulsion from the lateral joint capsule, excuse me, a little avulsion by the lateral joint capsule on the uh, proximal uh, lateral aspect of the tibia. And here, you're going to see impactions on the posterior lateral tibia and lateral femoral condyle, just like with that earlier pivot shift injury I talked about. And this is just because the ACL, as you know, is very commonly associated with a Sagan fracture. So the predominant bone bruises are going to be the exact same bone bruises you'll see with any ACL injury. Uh, but you also have to remember that these patients can get a posterior lateral corner injury. And it's important to, to uh, mention this to the orthopedic surgeon because he's going to be a little more aggressive in treating these patients with posterior lateral corner injuries. And what I mean by that is any structure that's over here in the posterior lateral corner, the popliteus muscle, for example. We talked about that a little earlier. Here's the popliteus muscle. There's abnormal signal within the muscle and around it, so it's clearly strained. You can see it over here on this T2-weighted sagittal image, too much signal within and around your popliteus muscle. That is considered a posterior lateral corner injury. Varus injury plus hyperextension, pretty uncommon. But again, to bring the point home, you're going to, because of the varus injury, you're going to get medial impactions. And because it's hyperextension, you're going to get anterior impactions. So combine them, you have anterior medial impactions of the tibial and femoral condyles. Therefore, you're going to look for posterior lateral soft tissue injury. These patients can also get ACL injury and even posterior capsule injury. Here you see the anterior medial bone bruises. And this person had a biceps femoris rupture. Here's the biceps femoris, doesn't quite make it down to the fibula, a lot of edema around it. When you look at the T2 axial images, you see there's a big hole here where the biceps femoris tendon should be. Flexion injuries I divide into two types, uh, flexion plus posterior tibial translation, which is essentially called a dashboard injury, and flexion with internal rotation of the femur on a fixed tibia, which will lead to patellar dislocation. Now, the dashboard injury occurs when the knee strikes against the dashboard during an auto accident or when the knee strikes against the ground during a fall. So what happens is force is applied to the anterior aspect of the proximal tibia in flexion. You get your bone bruise here, and then you get disruption of your PCL. Usually, again, it's going to be mid-substance, but it can be at the attachment site, as in this case. Uh, and you can sometimes get posterior joint capsule rupture as well. This is the most common mechanism for a PCL tear, the so-called dashboard injury. Lateral patellar dislocations occur in teenagers and young adults involved in athletic activities. You'll get impactions of the anterior aspect of the lateral femoral, con femoral condyle and the inframedial patella. You can get tears of your medial patella retinaculum, your MCL, and your, even your ACL with sufficient force. One thing you have to do is if you use your T2-weighted coronal images to look at the bone bruises, if you ever see a lateral um, femoral contusion, but you don't see the lateral tibial contusion like you're used to with ACL tears, take a good hard look at your patella. Because you might see this lateral contusion here in the femur, and there's your medial patellar contusion. And that's the footprint for a lateral patellar dislocation. What happens is the patella jumped out of the trochlear notch where it sits, impacted against the lateral femurs. The second the patient stood up, it popped right back in. And you get those very classic bone bruises tearing of the medial retinaculum as well. You can get osteochondral injuries that you should look for. In addition, here's a uh, nice example. This person actually has a hematocrit uh, level here. Uh, here's relatively normal cartilage on the undersurface, the, the lateral facet of the patella, but the medial facet, the cartilage is all disrupted. And uh, this person actually also had an uh, osteochondral fracture as well. Uh, femoral trochlear dysplasia, I like to mention this just because it can make you sound smart in your reports. Uh, basically, what this refers to is um, when the trochlear groove in which the patella normally sits becomes too shallow. So here's a normal trochlear groove. You see how nicely the patella is sitting in this trochlear groove of the anterior femur right here. Well, if that trochlear groove becomes convex rather than concave, then you can see how easily this patella is going to slide back and forth and be prone to dislocation. So to diagnose this, you find the axial slice, the axial slice through your menisci, then you go up three centimeters from that 
and you measure the trochlear depth. And you can either measure it from bone to bone or cartilage to cartilage, I don't care. But you, go, you just draw a tangent line, and then you measure the depth. And it should be at least three millimeters. If it's less than that, suggest the possibility of tro femoral trochlear dysplasia. Or if you see just a uh, you know, frank convexity like that, you want to suggest it. Now, be careful. This is really for younger patients. If you have an older patient with a lot of osteophytes, it can get very, very tricky. I want to spend the last uh, few minutes talking about the MRI of graft, uh, excuse me, of ACL reconstruction. And there are three things we need to talk about. The graft itself, the tunnels of the graft, and arthrofibrosis. Now, grafts nowadays are most commonly autografts, meaning they're from the patient who's receiving their own graft, essentially. And they're two commonly used autografts. You can either use the central one-third of the patellar tendon longitudinally, plus a little bone plug on each end. It's called a bone patellar tendon bone graft. Or what's being used more and more commonly today are hamstring tendons, the semitendinosus with or without the gracilis. And these may be folded on each other and looped around each other to increase the tensile strength of the graft. Now, you like to see a nice, normal, homogeneous graft like you see here. Uh, but you can see a little bit of increased signal intensity in the graft on both T1 and proton density images that can be normal in the first couple of years. It's thought to be due to vascularization. No one knows for sure. And you can even see very slight increased signal on, frank, on, on, uh, on T2 weighted images. It can be normal in the first couple of years. But really fluid signal intensity on T2 weighted images is considered abnormal. Again, what you want to see is a nice, almost normal appearing graft like that. Now, I just want to put this in as an example of a hamstring graft. This is actually a normal hamstring graft. And the reason why I put that in is, again, these hamstring grafts, a lot of times they fold and twist it around on each other before they put it into it to increase the tensile strength. So a lot of times they'll often have this sort of spiral appearance that's completely normal for these type of grafts. Graft ruptures, well, it's pretty straightforward. If you see non-visualization of the graft on proton density weighted images or any images, or if it's discontinuitous, uh, if you see, have increased signal intensity that's iso-intense or nearly iso-intense to fluid on T2-weighted images, again, that's going to be abnormal as well. How about the tunnels? Well, there are two tunnels you have to worry about, the femoral tunnel and the tibial tunnel. The femoral tunnel position determines what's called isometry, which is what permits constant length and tension of the graft throughout flexion and extension. This is what determines whether or not the graft is stable, essentially. And they have the tibial tunnel position, which determines the probability of whether or not the graft is going to be impinged. Now, the normal femoral tunnel on coronal images should aim either toward 1 or 11 o'clock, depending on which knee you're using, like you see here. And on sagittal images, the ideal graft, the tunnel should enter the uh, femur at the junction of the posterior femoral cortex and the physeal scar. So here's the posterior femoral cortex, physeal scar, and the graft is entering right there. And if you have an abnormal position, this can lead to instability and elongation of the graft. This is more at the 3 o'clock position instead of the 1 o'clock position, so this graft will probably fail. The normal tibial tunnel should be parallel but posterior to the slope of the intercondylar roof, what we talked about before, so-called Bloom and Satz line. So here's the graft. It's both posterior and parallel, or at least, or even a little bit greater slope than Bloom and Satz line. If it's too anterior, it crosses Bloom and Satz line, or the extension of it, you might get roof impingement or notch impingement. Here's an example of notch impingement. You can see, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a little bit of high signal within the ACL graft right there. And if you were to follow this on, on sequential sagittal images, you would see that the graft slope is that. And Blumenstadt's line is actually that. So this person's going to be prone to notch impingement. Another example, a little bit of increased signal right there in the graft. The graft slope is that. Blumenstadt's line is that. So this person's also going to be prone to notch impingement. Now, the way you diagnose this is you look for those lines. You do the, the, the measurements, just draw some tangents. You also look for that focal increased signal in the distal two-thirds of the graft. Uh, at least the uh, intraarticular portion of the graft, by three months after surgery, the graft can look bowed by the roof. Uh, this is treated by correction of the tunnel or notch plasty, and the signal will return to normal within about three months. Finally, arthrofibrosis. The etiology is really uncertain. It's usually situated anterior to a graft, and it can result in loss of terminal extension. You'll see low to intermediate signal on T1 and proton density weighted images, and also low signal intensity, although it may be more heterogeneous, on T2 weighted images. And it's called a cyclops lesion because when the, when the orthopedic surgeon or arthroscopist goes in there, it looks like a little red eye looking back at him. So basically, if you ever have a graft and you see some low signal intensity on T2-weighted images sitting in front of the graft like that, you want to raise the possibility that there may be some uh, fibrosis there or so-called cyclops lesion, particularly if the patient is not able to extend his or her knee fully. So conclusion, detailed descriptions of meniscal pathology will help the orthopedic surgeon decide on appropriate therapy. 
knowing the mechanism of injury may alert the radiologist to specific injury patterns on MRI and the post-operative MRI of the knee is becoming more common and basic understanding of operative procedures and complications is necessary. Thank you very much. As you know, most people, this is not most people's favorite subject, but you'll be surprised how much metabolic bone you see on a daily basis because osteoporosis is the most common metabolic bone disease, and we all see that every day. I was just going to talk a little bit about normal bone so you know a little bit about the pathophysiology. And as you know, uh, cortical bone is most of the bone mass, and then you have cancellous bone, which is uh, also in the, not only in the physis, uh, not only in the uh, patient's physis and metaphysis, but it also uh, extends into the medullary canal, and it's in flat bones. The cancellous bone is more metabolically active and has greater surface area. And then uh, cancellous bone, remember when you're just thinking about osteoporosis, uh, compressive, uh, the compressive trabecula are more important than the tensile, and the principal trabecula are more important than the secondary trabecula. And as we have bone loss, we're going to uh, lose more of the secondary trabecula first and uh, then the tensile. And uh, interesting uh, for orthopedic surgeons, if they have young people with uh, stress fractures, they find it uh, much more worrisome when the tensile area uh, if the patient has a fatigue fracture, has an abnormal signal in it, and they may go ahead and, prof at least our surgeon, will prophylactically pin the patient's hip if it's a runner or athlete. Uh, just to show you, this is from the National Osteoporosis Foundation, normal bone, and then patients who have osteoporosis. And as you can see, there's a poverty of the uh, trabecula. It's a poverty of bone. And there are specific uh, definitions that the World Health Organization has for osteoporosis. Now remember, there's about 20 million people in the world who suffer from this, and unfortunately, we're all going to have loss of bone mass as we age. And the problem is, because of the uh, decrease in the uh, bone strength, we have bone fragility, and we see this on a daily basis. We see patients who come in with compression fractures, and typical osteoporotic compression fracture. This one isn't a problem diagnostically because we have fat in the patient's uh, vertebral body, sometimes it may be difficult to tell an osteoporotic fracture from tumor. And of course, if it's an osteoporotic fracture, compression fracture, that's going to uh, eventually become fatty replaced. And there's a multiplicity of different ways to uh, evaluate the patient for osteoporosis. Uh, people use DEXA scans, you can use ultrasound, quantitative CT. And uh, what you want to report is the uh, patient's, what's important is the patient's T-score, which is the normal um, bone marrow density for a young adult of the same sex. Normally, we should have a T-score that's at or greater than minus one. And every standard deviation that's uh, more than one off means that you have a 10 to 20% bone density loss. Now, osteoporosis is defined by the World Health Organization as having a T-scale at or below uh, minus 2.5. And osteopenia, which is low bone mass by their definition, is a patient who has a T-score between minus 1 and minus 2.5. And uh, as we saw before in some of those uh, patients that we were looking at the medullary canal in the, uh, or in the uh, bone uh, edema patterns that we looked at in the hip, uh, this is a common location where you'll see patients who have uh, insufficiency fractures. And not only do osteoporotic patients can get an in insufficiency uh, fracture uh, in the pubic symphysis, not infrequently I'll see them in the supraacetabular region and in the acetabulum as well as the sacrum. And of course, uh, the typical uh, films that we see every day in our practice of uh, insufficiency osteoporotic fractures that we can notice frequently on chest radiographs as well as lumbar spine abdominal films. And if you see that, sometimes the referring physician doesn't even realize that the patient has osteoporosis. And I usually recommend that they get a DEXA scan so that they can start intervention. Now, uh, this is one of people's uh, your probably your most favorite subject of all, uh, vitamin D metabolism, osteo osteomalacia, and rachetic syndromes. This little guy over here happened to be my daughter's iguana who subsequently passed away, but she did have metabolic bone disease. And you can see in here she has this uh, insufficiency fracture 
and she has edema in her soft tissues, and she has osteomalacia with uh, smudged trabecula and uh, loss of definition of the trabecula. But if you happen to see a rachetic syndrome or osteomalacia when you're in Louisville, uh, they, what's also important in addition to recognizing that the patient has this abnormality is the examiner will ask you uh, the differential diagnosis. And if you keep in mind very simply vitamin D metabolism, then you can give a decent uh, differential diagnosis. And remember the active portion, in order to have the active uh, vitamin D hormone, you have two hydroxylations. You have one in the liver and a second one in the kidney. You can also have deficiency states and uh, malabsorption, uh, patients who have nutritional, uh, neonatal, and then there are a variety of other processes that uh, can cause osteomalacia and rickets, such as those which cause associated with phosphate loss, renal tubular uh, disorders, oops, here we are, and then there are a variety of other osteomalacic syndromes that have normal vitamin D metabolism, phosphorus, and calcium. And uh, just a very classic appearance of rickets, you see the cupping and fraying of the metaphysis. The patients can have this wide, ill-defined growth plate because of the disorganized growth. The patients can have unsharped epiphyses, as we see in here. And uh, in the skull, they have a very thin calvarium, and they can have bony remodeling, which results in a craniotabes appearance, a square skull. And as the children become weight-bearing, they're going to get bowing deformities because these are weak bones. And again, you can see this uh, classic cupping and fraying of the patient's metaphysis, the very wide growth plate, loss of definition of the epiphysis. They can get scoliosis, um, and they can also uh, develop this triradiate appearance because of the intrusion of the patient's hips and uh, spine into the pelvis. <coughs> And, of course, these patients will have delayed skeletal maturation. Uh, patients who have osteomalacia, which is the same process in the adult skeleton, will have osteopenia. They'll have a loss of their secondary trabecula. And as we can see in this patient, this patient over here uh, actually had uh, osteomalacia induced from aluminum toxicity. He was a patient with uh, uh, renal failure. And you have unsharp trabecula because you lose mineralized osteoid in these patients with osteomalacia. The osteoid seams are actually insufficiency fractures. You can see one over here. And they occur along the concave margin. When you think about these similar uh, looser zones that we get in Paget's disease, they're along the convex surface. So osteoid seams in osteomalacia, you can see them here along the concave margin. And there's a couple of other names. And uh, of course you can see similar uh, osteoid seams or looser bones in any area where you have high bone turnover. Uh, this was a patient who has renal osteodystrophy and you can see how uh, she has this fracture uh, through her femoral neck. And if you look closely, if you happen to see one of these on board, you can see that she has signs of secondary hyperparathyroidism with this uh, subligamentous resorption over here and the ischium and the subchondral resorption along her SI joints, uh, subperiosteal resorption. This was a patient who has osteomalacia, and here are these very characteristic looser zones, these insufficiency fractures, just like we'll see in some patients with osteoporosis porosis in the pubic rami, superior and inferior pubic rami. Frequently, they'll be symmetric. And <clears throat> hypophosphatasia is a specific uh, rachetic syndrome, which is an autosomal uh, recessive process where they have defective mineralization. They'll have a low alkaline phosphatase, and they have abnormal urine and serum uh, phosphoethylamine. In the uh, newborn state, these children are very osteopenic. Sometimes you'll even see, uh, if you're shown an OB ultrasound on boards, that if you see a patient on an OB ultrasound who has abnormal bones, uh, that can be uh, hypophosphatasia will be in, in the differential. Now one of the things that distinguishes this process, even though it's very uncommon, from other rachetic syndromes is you see this very characteristic lucent extension into the metaphyses. And these little triangular extensions happen to be uh, the unmineralized matrix. And you can see, too, this patient has bowing deformities. This is the very characteristic rachetic rosary uh, that these uh, children can develop 
So you can see on her humeri, and this patient's humeri, you have this very characteristic lucent area extending into the metaphysis of the humerus. And you can see the rachetic changes in the growth plate. Excellent hypophosphatemia is uh, vitamin D resistant rickets. And you think of this as something you'll never see. Well, I happened to have a case two days ago that just came across. Much to my surprise, a 23-year-old whose uh, child was diagnosed with uh, this process. So, of course, they looked at the mother and the siblings. And in these patients, this is the most common hereditary type of rickets, and they have a defective renal transport of phosphorus. These patients are going to have hypophosphaturia, low serum phosphorus. They have normal calcium. And in children, as you see in this particular uh, child, that the rickettic changes are not as severe as what we see in renal rickets. They have growth retardation, and usually the uh, patients do not have severe osteopenia, as we see in uh, some of these other states. In adults, you'll frequently see these uh, entheopathy, and you'll see these anterior flowing osteophytes, which we know is a common and a multiplicity of other entities, and these patients can get osteosclerosis. Now over here, just uh, this is for board candidates, if you're shown a case of generalized entheopathy and you need a differential diagnosis, don't forget to mention this vitamin D resistant hypophosphatemic rickets. And this is a case where we see the anterior paravertebral ossification, and it looks very similar to DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, which we all see on a daily basis. This happens to be a patient who has fluorosis, and as you see, there are other entities, including uh, hypo uh, parathyroidism and pseudo pseudo hypoparathyroidism. You can also see this in acromegaly. Here's a patient with acromegaly. Notice the big thick heel pad and the uh, patient has, has these areas of uh, entheopic change at the insertion of the Achilles and plantar aponeurosis. A very uncommon uh, process and Proteus syndrome is very interesting to me. Uh, this was uh, supposed to be, actually people believe this is what the elephant man had, not neurofibromatosis. Uh, but uh, Proteus syndrome, and they have hamartomas. If you're shown a case on boards of localized gigantism or gigantism in the hands and feet, you can see in here that this is also occurs in this process where they have numerous hamartomas and uh, a bunch of other associated abnormalities. Now, renal osteodystrophy, if you're in, working in an institution where you have a lot of patients with renal failure or dialysis center, you're going to see this. You're going to run across this uh, probably not infrequently, and you'll see changes on chest radiograph and other parts of the patient's anatomy. And this is a, renal osteodystrophy is actually related to a combination of hyperparathyroid bone disease and abnormal vitamin D metabolism. Osteoidus fibrosis cystica is hyperparathyroid bone disease. You get osteomalacia, osteosclerosis, osteopenia. Some of this seems almost uh, contradictory, but the reason you can get osteosclerosis, even though the patient's uh, have a significant bone resorption. Remember, too, that not only are the osteoclasts stimulated, but also the osteoblasts. So you are having bone formation, but usually the bone resorption outpaces the uh, bone formation. Oops, there we are. Uh, in, in this particular patient, very nicely on uh, CT is quite nice to see this. This was a young patient that we saw in the last month who came in, and they were concerned that he had this palpable mass in his groin. And so the first thing the clinician thought is, oh my God, this patient has a tumor. And if you, we windowed this so you could see the fluid fluid levels very nicely, but this is tumoral calcinosis in this patient. And you notice all these little uh, calcium fluid levels. So this is related to the calcium phosphorus mismatch in patients who have uh, renal osteodystrophy. And this is the sub subchondral resorption that's very characteristic. Uh, that we see. And you can see if you're looking at this on a radiograph or you're looking at it on CT, you might mistake that for sacroiliitis, but it, uh, it really isn't. It's a different pattern of bone resorption. And here we have another patient with a very characteristic rugger jersey spine and the sclerosis along the end plates. Here there's a mild uh, compression deformity of one of the vertebra. Now, most of these patients who have secondary hyperparathyroid bone disease will have osteopenia. And not only do they get bone resorption, you think of the classic subperiosteal bone resorption along the radial aspect of the second uh, middle phalanx, 
but they get bone resorption everywhere. The osteoclasts don't just target one area. So you're going to see subchondral resorption as we see here, and notice how this patient's AC joint looks widened. You get subligamentous resorption as we see here at the insertion of the coracoclavicular ligament. Uh, you can see this intracortical tunneling and bone resorption causing the uh, salt and pepper skull. And, of course, the osteosclerosis can produce this rugger jersey spine. You can see changes in the sclerotic appearance of the pelvis. And another thing that's a very interesting phenomena is periosteal neostosis, where you get periosteal new bone formation. And initially, when I saw this particular patient, I remember him quite well, uh, I thought he had Paget's disease. But this is actually from the periosteal new bone formation related to his uh, secondary hyperparathyroidism. This patient had renal osteodystrophy. And again, you have to think about the uh, differential for this process. In secondary hyperparathyroid bone disease in children, uh, particularly when it's more advanced, you can, this was a, a child who came in, and the diagnosis is on the film, so if you got a boards case like this, it would be very much fun. But over here, this patient had, uh, has uh, bilateral multicystic dysplastic kidneys, and here's one of the inferior aspect of one of the kidneys. And that's why uh, this poor little guy uh, has uh, renal failure and this severe uh, renal rickets and osteomalacia. But this patient happened to ve develop slip femoral capital epiphysis. You can see the, the, the asymmetry between uh, both uh, proximal uh, femora. And then on the MR, we very nicely see that the patient has the slip femoral capital epiphysis. Uh, this is, uh, happens to be the triradiate appearance of the pelvis, again, uh, as we saw in osteomalacia. This is a patient with hyperparathyroid bone disease and osteomalacia from his chronic renal failure. But see how the, we have this more uh, triangular appearance from the intrusion of the patient's uh, hips and spine. And uh, this case would also be a good one for boards because you could see the subchondral resorption, subligamentous resorption, uh, resorption along the pubic symphysis, uh, subperiosteal resorption, and the reason this patient has the uh, right hip uh, bipolar prosthesis is because he had developed uh, osteonecrosis of his hip. And uh, brown tumors can occur. Remember, if you're asked on boards uh, which is more common, uh, is it primary or secondary hyperparathyroid bone disease? Well, you'll see bone, brown tumors more commonly in primary hyperparathyroidism but we see so many more patients with renal osteodystrophy that when you see brown tumors, they're going to be more commonly diagnosed in these patients with uh, renal osteodystrophy. And this was a patient that I saw a couple months ago who uh, has tertiary hyperparathyroid bone disease. She, has, uh, she ended up having a parathyroid adenoma, but she has chronic renal failure. And all this uh, replacement in the marrow was brown tumor, which fractured. So she has this uh, fracture through the uh, area of the brown tumor, and th these are just everywhere, unfortunately. And these patients, too, this is another uh, board favorite that they like to show, is a patient who has a spontaneous uh, ligamentous disruption or avulsion, and these patients uh, certainly can develop uh, this problem, um, some mineralization, and then subsequently this patient has avulsed uh, his uh, patellar tendon. And this is another patient who had a brown tumor in his glenoid. So they can be all over the place. And uh, I've had several patients where they were concerned uh, that the patient had metastatic disease because the first thing everybody assumes is when you have a lytic lesion, it's metastatic disease. Well, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's something uh, that's much easier to treat. Uh, Dialysis-related amyloid arthropathy is also a favorite thing that uh, likes to be shown on boards because this can simulate an aggressive uh, process, like a neuropathic joint or uh, infectious process. And what happens is you have, uh, on patients who have chronic dialysis, long-term dialysis, they can get deposition of this beta-2 microglobulin. And not only does it deposit in joint capsules, but you can get it in the discs, articular cartilage, in bone, in muscle. Uh, this was a very interesting uh, gentleman in his 30s, long-term dialysis, and all of uh, this material in his shoulder is the amyloid. And we could see that uh, this is a T2 weight, this is a T1 pre of T1 post contrast with fat saturation, and his rotator cuff is kind of munched up too from this process as well. And the radiographs really didn't show much of anything, but we can see some of the pressure erosions, particularly on the axial image, from the amyloid. 
Uh, this happened to be a doctor that I had worked with when I was at Georgetown who was on uh, dialysis, and you could see these little lytic areas within his carpal bone related to uh, amyloid. And uh, here's the uh, spine, which can simulate a patient who has an infectious spondylitis. Now, if you're shown something like this on boards, the clue would be that you see the osseous changes of uh, secondary hyperparathyroidism with the rugger Jersey spine, the sclerosis in the end plates. And here is the uh, destruction and the amyloid deposition. Uh, Paget's disease, we uh, talked about that a little bit earlier in regards to the secondary uh, malignancies that can occur in pagetoid bone, but Paget's is a pretty common disorder affecting about 4% uh, of people who are over 55, so you're going to see it in your practice. And uh, this is thought to be related to uh, uh, paramyxovirus, and it affects the osteoclast, and you can see what happens with these deformities. And these patients will have elevated serum alkphos when they're in the mixed phase of Paget's, and what they have is bone resorption and disorga disorganized bone uh, formation. Now, in MR, they can have a variable appearance depending upon whether or not the marrow is atrophied or if you have this fibrovascular tissue which causes increased uptake. You can notice over here that there's a, actually a poverty of trabecula in this area of pagetoid bones. And then we can see on the T2 weighted image that there's increased signal. And uh, that's related to this uh, fibrovascular tissue. Now these are usually polyostotic, but up to a third of them can be monoostotic. And here we have uh, a variety of different patients who have Paget's disease. You'll see it frequently in the pelvis, in the sacrum, in the spine, in the skull, and then in the long bones. And uh, depending upon uh, how long the patient has it, you'll have a variable appearance. And here we could see this sclerosis, this thickening of the iliopubic line of the uh, patient's ischium. Uh, this patient happens to have uh, a fracture through the proximal femur, as well as extensive uh, pagetic bone involving the whole left uh, hemipelvis, and some involvement in the proximal right femur. Uh, this is a skull involvement where you have this cotton wool appearance, and then we see these not infrequently uh, on bone scan, and in the spine here where we have this enlarged vertebral body, and this looks like there's very coarse in trabecula, but this is different than the appearance of a hemangioma in the spine. Now, when you're looking at the three different phases, osteolytic, this mixed phase, and then the healing phase, this is the, if you're going to use uh, different uh, phrases on your oral boards, just make sure you know that you're using the phrase, uh, the buzzword, they call those buzzwords appropriately, and this blade of grass or flame is the characteristic appearance of this osteolytic phase of Paget's disease. Here we see the area of involvement in the skull, which is osteoporosis circumscripta. And sometimes when you're looking at a skull film, it's difficult to tell which is the abnormal one. Is it the more radiolucent or is it the more radio uh, dense part that's abnormal? And a bone scan will clearly show you that. This is a mixed phase. And then uh, as the patient has more advanced disease and healing, you'll see, oops, you'll see this uh, sclerotic phase. Uh, this patient, you can see that there's more uh, sclerotic phase uh, on the left and a mixed phase on the right. Oops, let me see. Next. Okay, these patients, because the bone is abnormal, they'll get bowing deformities. This is another patient who has Paget's disease, and notice how, because the bone is enlarged, you can have spinal stenosis, basilar invagination. If you have this involvement in the base of your skull, uh, you can have cranial nerve pathology. And these patients can get these incomplete fractures, these insufficiency fractures, that look very much like the process we saw in osteomalacia, except these little insufficiency fractures, this is a femur over here, are on the convex side. Now these, uh, these patients will develop degenerative joint disease, most commonly you'll see it in the hip and knee, and uh, they can have secondary involvement of different types of tumors. This is a patient who had a giant cell tumor arising in the sacrum, crossing the SI joint. Another patient, you think of giant cell tumors arising in uh, phagetic bone, most commonly in the skull and facial bones. They can also have superimposed uh, processes, a plethora of pathology, and sarcomatous transformation uh, was discussed 
earlier. Fortunately, this is a very rare situation. It arises in the fibrous tissue, and most of these are going to be osteogenic sarcoma, but you can also have MFH and fibrosarcomas, chondrosarcoma, very rarely in angiosarc. Patients going to present with pain, swelling, and they could have a fracture. Uh, can patients, as you see here, not infrequently, you, you may not see uh, osteoid matrix, but this patient did have some osteoid matrix. And here's the underlying pagetoid bone, and unfortunately, this absolutely enormous uh, secondary malignancy. And as you see, there's other complications. The patients can have crystalline arthropathy, infection. Something that simulates Paget's disease, but in younger patients, is hyperphosphatasia, uh, also called juvenile Paget. And this is a very, fortunately, it's a rare, painful, uh, a rare disorder that's very painful. This happens to be one of the two recently diagnosed uh, Navajo Indian children who has this uh, hereditary hypophosphatasia. And it was found that this is due to a lack of a gene which produces this OPG. These patients have elevated ALKFOS, and you can see they have this thick cortex, wide bones, the epiphyses are spared. These patients have enlarging head, as you can see here, because this was the 17-year-old uh, patient with this disorder. And then they can have uh, premature tooth loss. Scurvy, hypovitaminosis uh, C, fortunately we don't see that very much. What happens uh, when you have uh, insufficient vitamin C is that you'll have decreased collagen synthesis, and as a result you'll end up with uh, poor bone matrix and disorganized growth. Uh, these are some of the buzzwords that are associated with the findings on radiographs. The white line of Frankel happens to be the area of the provisional zone of calcification. Since calcification is not, uh, this area is unaffected, you'll have this white sclerotic line. The Wimberger's ring is the same thing occurring in the periphery of the epiphysis. So this is the mineralization in the epiphysis. This is different uh, than the Wimberger sign in patients who have congenital Lewis. Uh, 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 Palkin spur is this uh, little uh, white line of Frankel that extends out into the metaphysis. And then the tremofield zone, or scurvitic uh, line, happens to be the radiolucent line that's subjacent uh, to this provisional zone of calcification where you have detritus. Now these patients can have, because this is abnormal bone, they can get subperiosteal hemorrhage. And notice all this mineralization. Here's some periostitis related to the same process. Uh, they can get central metaphyseal cupping. Something that can mimic this process is uh, methotrexate osteopathy. Patients who have hypervitaminosis A, fortunately we don't see that very often uh, in our pediatric uh, practice, but I do see it uh, in adults who are on Accutane. So you'll see this in patients who have uh, therapy for their acne, and they end up with a process that looks very much like a diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, and that other patient that we saw who had uh, vitamin D resistant rickets. It's also in that uh, differential. And then finally, osteopetrosis, uh, marble bone disease. There's four different types, and these patients are uh, all patients from University of Illinois that have a variety of different manifestations depending upon the uh, type that they have. But they have normal bone production, but they have abnormal osteoclastic bone resorption. And what we can see here in this particular patient, he has these uh, fractures of both proximal femora, and you can see the uh, sclerosis, and there's this sclerosis along the periphery. This patient has this more homogeneous osteosclerosis, but there are areas uh, which are not involved in the iliac crest, where this particular patient just has this, these numerous non-healing, non-united fractures, and uh, really just dense bones. On MR, it's a very uh, interesting appearance because usually the bones will look black. And then, uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to present any more, but I want to thank you for your attention and wish you good luck on your uh, visit to Louisville. Um, our next half an hour is going to be spent on imaging of arthritis. Um, and although most types of arthritis, I mean, frequently the patient is seeing rheumatologists, they have positive rheumatoid factor, blah, blah, blah. You know, the you're not always making the diagnosis, um, but sometimes um, you're asked, well, frequently you're asked to evaluate progression. I mean, some of these patients are on heavy-duty drugs like methotrexate, um, and what uh, the clinician wants to know is has there been progression 
of the patient's disease. So you need to know where to look with the different arthritis, where to look for early changes uh, in arthritis. I always tell the residents, look at the soft tissues first. I mean, mainly we're looking at hands, and we're going to talk a lot mainly about hands today. But we'll talk about spine a little bit, but look at the soft tissues first. Look for soft tissue swelling. Look for calcifications, because if you don't make a point of doing that, you may get distracted by other things like bone erosions. Um, evaluate for symmetry and distribution. Some arthritis are symmetrical, some are not. Um, and evaluate for periosteal reaction. It's a component of some arthritis, but not others. And alignment abnormalities. Now let's talk about rheumatoid arthritis, which is the most common um, inflammatory arthritis that we see. Um, it's notoriously symmetrical. Um, both hands are going to look the same. Um, there's periarticular soft tissue swelling, and the distribution in rheumatoid tends to be proximal, meaning that it's in the carpus, it's in the radiocarpal articulation, it's in the MCPs, it's at the PIPs, but rarely does it involve the DIPs. And if it does involve the DIPs, it's going to be to a lesser degree than the other joints. Subluxations are common, sacroiliitis, this is the exception to the symmetry, it can be asymmetrical. Um, osteoporosis tends to be juxtaarticular because of the hyperemia. Uh, periostitis is not a part of adult onset rheumatoid. Um, and the alignment abnormalities we're all familiar with, the ulnar drift, the ulnar deviation, the swan neck deformities, and the boutonniere deformities, the early erosions of rheumatoid are marginal. That's where you want to look. You want to look in the hands for marginal MCP erosions. You want to look for ulnar styloid erosions. Uh, this is a schematic diagram of, say, a uh, joint, an MCP joint. This is the bone, this is the capsule, uh, and this is the articular cartilage or the hyaline cartilage. And what happens in rheumatoids, you get this synovitis, this panis formation, and the place it attacks the bone first is going to be in the bare areas of the joint. This is the part of the joint that's not protected by this hyaline cartilage. So that's where your money is. You want to look at those bare areas for marginal erosions. And of course, eventually you go on and destroy all the joint. So here's a patient with rheumatoid, um, and you're looking at this hand. So where are you going to look? Well, you're going to look at the ulnar style. That looks pretty clean to me right now. But look right here. Look right at the margins of the joint. Um, and here, on this magnified view of the same radiograph, you can see that marginal erosion. So that's why I say it's as important to know where to look. Here's a patient with more advanced rheumatoid. Um, the patient has a lot of subluxation, ulnar subluxation. Um, the patient also has ulnar drift of the carpal bones. You notice how they're sliding over to the ulnar side of the wrist. And the patient has a big, big erosion of the distal ulna. But you notice in this patient with severe disease, that the DIP joints are spared. Another patient with severe rheumatoid arthritis, we have great boutonniere deformities. This patient also has um, silastic implants that are sometimes used as a last resort in patients with severe rheumatoid. Uh, there are a lot of complications with these joints. You can get a silicone arthritis. So they're not completely benign, but you can see that they're little stems of the sciolastic joint going up into uh, the bone. Now, when you have a foot, and I have, you know, 20% of patients with rheumatoid present, not with hand symptoms, but with foot and ankle symptoms. So it's not uncommon to get foot radiographs and looking for rheumatoid arthritis. The best place to look in the foot is going to be at the fifth metacarpal, metatarsal phalangeal joint. That's where your money is. Um, and here we can see their marked erosions uh, in this patient. You can see their marked erosions over here uh, in the fifth. Okay, there's a, just a, an arrow on that same radiograph. Uh, in the spine, one of the common things we see, especially in the cervical spine, is C1, C2 subluxation. Um, here we see the anterior arch, anterior arch of C1, and the odontoid, and here we see widening of that. Uh, with subluxation. The patients can also get stair-stepping and other subluxations, but this is the most common. Interesting thing about this patient, you also notice that she has disc disease here, and disc disease is not always uh, degenerative. This is a patient 
that has disc disease on the basis of her inflammatory arthritis. Um, here we have widening of the AC joint, common in rheumatoid and erosions of the humeral head. Uh, again, marked uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Sometimes we're asked to do MR for rheumatoid, and that again is to demonstrate that there are changes consistent with the rheumatoid to see if there are any bone erosions that we can pick up on MR. Uh, this is the plain film of this patient that looks normal. Uh, we did, uh, this is a T1, this is a post GAD. So all this stuff that's enhancing here is synovium. We didn't see any um, bone erosions, but we do demonstrate that there is synovium. The slow on T1 and enhances with gadolinium. Another uh, not uncommon but unique finding that's seen in rheumatoid and also tuberculosis is what's called rice bodies. And you have all this dead synovium that's in the joint. And it's sort of interesting image-wise. If you look at this MR, this T1, uh, it's in the subdeltoid bursa, but it's really hard to see. You do GAD, and this dead synovium, of course, does not enhance. Uh, on the T2, you can see all these little rice bodies. And there again, this patient. Now, what's the difference between adult onset and juvenile onset? They're a little bit different. Um, periosteal reaction can be a part of juvenile onset rheumatoid or juvenile chronic rheumatoid. Uh, C-spine fusion is a part of juvenile onset but not adult. And you may have a small mandible, micronathia. Carpal fusion is very common. And one of the classic findings is a short fourth metacarpal. Uh, if you look at this patient, you look, she has a lot of carpal disease, bilaterally symmetrical, but also there's a short fourth. Uh, if you draw a tangent to the fifth and the fourth, it intersects a third. Um, and here's another patient with juvenile onset, a lot of carpal ankylosis. Severe juvenile onset now in an older patient with complete ankylosis of the carpus. This is your typical cervical spine in a juvenile onset rheumatoid. Micronathia, you can see the mandible small. Uh, fusion of the apophyseal joints and fusion of the uh, vertebral bodies, which is not something you would see in adult onset. The classic findings of the knee, widened intercondylar notch, overgrowth of the epiphysis. Okay, and our next, um, of course, let me just go back. Let's say, this, of course, you can also see in hemophilia, but we see it more commonly in juvenile onset. Now, the second most common inflammatory arthritis we see is psoriasis. Um, and usually the patient has a known history of psoriasis 10 years or more, but sometimes that's not always true. Sometimes they, their rash has not been, been discovered. It's not that common in psoriasis, only 5% of the patients. Um, it's different from rheumatoid in its distribution. It's very asymmetrical. Uh, it tends to be distal. So you're going to have DIP disease. In the spine, you're going to have non-marginal syndesmophytes. We're going to talk about those. And bilateral asymmetrical sacroiliitis. Um, they really don't get the juxtarticular osteoporosis, the hyperemia that uh, rheumatoid patients get. And the classic picture, the buzzword, uh, would be pencil and cup type of deformity at the joint. Uh, here's a patient with pencil and cup deformities, uh, DIP disease. This is not going to be rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, here's another patient with sort of a uh, pencil and half a cup, okay, but this is not going to be rheumatoid. Another thing that you can sometimes see on a radiograph, here we have uh, nail thickening. There's pitting of the nails, um, which is characteristic of uh, psoriasis. Um, here's a patient with severe uh, psoriatic involvement, uh, asymmetrical disease. Uh, this patient has sort of a pencil and pencil. It has ankylosis here. Uh, but again, this is not going to be rheumatoid because of the distribution. Uh, this one is a case I love to show residents because they get distracted by this carpal ankylosis. Uh, they say, oh, rheumatoid. And oh, there's all the stylone erosion. It's rheumatoid. But you have to look at the whole picture in this patient. And if you look at these DIPs, there's a lot of DIP involvement. Um, and this one is probably even ankylosed. And almost never do you see ankylosis, almost never, uh, of a DIP jointed rheumatoid. Um, this patient uh, has little erosions here, the DIP. Again, 
a patient with psoriasis. And here's a magnified view of that. Now, sometimes the distribution of psoriasis is uh, in a single ray, like a sausage digit. Clinically, the, the rheumatologist sees this swollen, fusiform swelling of the digit. So rather than juxtarticular swelling like you see in rheumatoid, you see swelling of uh, the complete digit, and you tend to get joint involvement in that sausage digit. You can see this is narrowed, and this is eroded. Here's another patient with a sausage digit. Swelling, joint involvement, joint involvement. Um, and this is just, again, a patient with a sausage digit. Now, in the spine, um, like I said, psoriatic arthritis uh, tends to have uh, asymmetrical sacroiliitis. Of course, when you go on and fuse your sacroiliac joints, they're going to be symmetrical. And then they get these bulky, non marginal syndesmophytes. Uh, and here we see them here, that are different from the ones of ang spine and inflammatory bowel disease. They're bulkier. They don't arise at these little corners. Now, just uh, sometimes people have uh, difficulty separating all these bony outgrowths from the spine. I think this is helpful. If you really um, are strict, syndesmophytes are going to be ossification of the annulus fibrosis, ang spine. They're slender. They arise at the corners. Osteophytes, of course, are you know, degenerative changes, they are going to be hyperostosis at the annulus fibers, uh, and they're going to be horizontal. Uh, and then DISH, you get these flowing paravedival ossifications and anterior longitudinal ligament uh, ossifications. And in psoriasis and riders, which are the same for all practical purposes, image-wise, uh, you get these paravedival ossifications that uh, are just bulkier than these little slender syndesmophytes. Um, and here's a patient just with sacroiliitis. It's kind of hard to see. Uh, and here, sacroiliitis uh, and these paravertebral ossifications. Now, Reiter's disease, for all practical purposes, is going to look the same. It tends to involve the feet um, and not uh, the hands. Uh, and the classic is a lover's heel. Uh, this patient uh, has a lover's heel. If you look at the posterior calcaneus here, it's a little bit fuzzy. Uh, this one is the normal side that's sharp. And we use the term lover's heel for riders because it's, uh, it may be sexually transmitted. And there it is. Okay. Here's a patient just with a lot of disease in the feet that is um, uh, rider's disease and sacroiliitis. Now, ang spine, um, the party line that the, is that the sacroiliitis is bilateral symmetrical. Bamboo spine is classic, um, and they may be at risk for pseudo-articulation with, with minor trauma, and that is a rheumatological emergency. Now, early ang spine may be sort of subtle. Uh, in um, male patients, the, um, the ang spine begins at the SI joints, goes to the lumbar spine, goes to the T-spine, goes to the cervical spine. In a, progression, a normal progression, an orderly progression. In female patients, it may jump around a little, a little bit. But one of the early findings you see in ang spine is squaring off of the vertebral bodies. You're losing the normal sort of smooth convexity of the vertebral bodies, and you're getting a little new bone formation. And here is a magnified view of the same patient, and there's a little bit of sclerosis there, a little bit of sclerosis there, and this is early ang spine with shiny corners. Here's a more classic, uh, later development in ang spine, a patient with a bamboo spine. Everyone's familiar with this, uh, complete fusion of the spine. Uh, and here's another patient with uh, ang spine. You can see these apophyseal joints are all fused posteriorly. Okay, this patient, oh, has fusion of the spine. Sacroiliac joints are completely fused. Uh, and here's very late. Uh, there's complete fusion of the spine and the pelvis and the sacroiliac joints. Now this is what uh, I'm talking about, the trivial trauma. These patients come in, maybe they, were, maybe they were in an automobile accident, but maybe it was just some trivial trauma, and the patient comes in and says, hey doc, I can move my neck again. That's not a good sign. That means they have a fracture and it's a neurological emergency. Okay, let's talk about the most common arthritis that we see, osteoarthritis. Distribution, symmetrical. Distribution, distal. 
when you get erosions in osteoarthritis, they're not marginal, but they're going to be central. Uh, no periosteal reaction, and in the spine, you get discal chain disease and osteophytes. Um, whoops, so if you look at this diagram, DIP joint, basal joint, triscaphy joint, that's where your money is. And here's a patient, and you can see these osteophytes here, these erosions, and actually this patient is getting some essential erosions. Uh, and this patient has ankylosis, uh, which is not uncommon in erosive osteoarthritis, that they get fusion of a DIP joint. Now, here's what I mean about central erosions. Rather than getting erosions here at the margins, the erosions are right in the middle of the joint, and it gives you what we call a seagull appearance to the DIP joints. It's kind of like when you were a little kid and you drew the little gull wings, the little seagulls in your pictures, you drew them like that. And that's pretty much pathognomonic of erosive osteoarthritis. Of course, we've all seen anterior osteophytes. I'm not going to dwell on that. And this patient has a spondylolisthesis and disc disease. Okay, let's go on to some of the other mixed connective tissue diseases. And um, um, one of the things that we see not infrequently is lupus. Now, everything in uh, rheumatology is not black and white because there are lots of overla overlap syndromes. And lupus actually is not uncommonly overlapped with rheumatoid arthritis. But the classic pic pictures of lupus are going to be ulnar, I mean, you're going to have ulnar deviations, swan neck deformities, boot near deformities. You're going to have ligamentous laxity without bone erosions. Okay, so you have what people will call a jacuz type of arthritis. Um, without erosions. And here's your classic picture. Looks like rheumatoid, but there are no bone erosions here. There are no bone er erosions here. So you can get swan neck deformities, you can get boutonniere deformities and ulnar deviation. And here's another patient with classic lupus where you're getting these boutonniere deformities. Now, other connective tissue diseases, scleroderma, the classic findings are loss of the distal tufts, acroosteolysis, and soft tissue calcinosis. Uh, the alignment abnormalities are generally okay until their skin gets so tight that you have, um, you know, contractures, and then they get the abnormality, the alignment abnormalities. Here's a classic picture of a patient with scleroderma with very advanced acroosteolysis, but again, there's some calcinosis. Uh, here, we've lost soft tissue, we have some calcinosis, and this is pretty much classic. Frequently, this calcification will be really chunky in the fingers like that. Very chunky calcinosis. But again, you can see this loss of the distal tufts. There's a differential for acroosteolysis. I'm not going to dwell on this. Uh, but hypopara is common. Scleroderma, psoriasis, frostbite, leprosy, PVC, leshnion gets rarer down here. Congenital insensitivity to pain, vascular disease, multicentric reticular histocytosis, which we will look at today, sarcoid and pycnodystocytosis, pachyderma, periastitis. And as a radiologist, you know, in your training, you're taught that this is, has always got to be on the tip of your tongue. Now, let's talk about one of my favorite things, which is uh, CPBD arthropathy. Um, a lot of people will say, well, you know, calcium biophosphate, that's pseudogout, that's chondrocalcidosis, they're all synonyms. And I don't think of it that way. Um, I think of it with this old Venn diagram. We have CPBD arthropathy, you have pseudogout, and you have chondrocalcinosis. Uh, pseudogout is a clinical syndrome. I look at a radiograph, and I cannot tell you if a patient has pseudogout or not, because I cannot tell you that the patient has gout-like attacks. I can tell you the patient has calcified cartilage, chondrocalcinosis, um, and I can sometimes tell you that the patient has joint changes that look like crystal disease, even if I don't see the chondrocalcinosis. So they're not synonyms. Chondrocalcinosis, for example, can be secondary, can be CBBD arthropathy, but you also see it in hypopara, especially primary, Wilson disease, alcaptinuria, trauma, hemochromatosis in this familial form. Uh, when you're talking about CPBD arthropathy, what do you see? You see what looks like OA, but it's in the wrong place. If you look at this patient and they had what looks like OA here and there at the MCPs uh, and the radial scaphoid articulation, that's not where you get OA. You get OA, remember, DIPs, basal joint, triscaphy joint. CPBD looks like OA, but in the wrong joints or the wrong parts of joints, 
variable velocity of information, huge subchondral cyst. Um, here's a patient with what? There is a little maybe chondrocalcinosis here, but if you look at the overall picture, what's the worst part of this joint, the patellofemoral joint? So classically, CPV deathropathy in the, patel in the knee gives you a lot of patellofemoral joint, but sparing of the weight-bearing part of the joint. Or at least when it does this, you think of crystal disease. Here's a patient with calcification of the triangle fiber cartilage. She's getting scapholuminate dissociation, and we're going to talk about what that means. Um, here's a patient with very faint chondrocalcinosis here and in the pubic symphysis. Now, look at this patient. This is, these are bilateral hands. Look at that. Big beak-like osteophyte. That's not OA. Could it be post-traumatic? If it's isolated to one joint, yeah. But it's also common to see in CPPD arthropathy. And here, we have these beak-like osteophytes in the wrong places. Again, CPPD arthropathy. Now, let's talk about a slack risk, scapholuminate advanced collapse. It can be post-traumatic, uh, but frequently we see it in patients with underlying calcium biophosphate, and it's really something you should mention if it's bilateral that this patient has crystal disease. First of all, this patient has chondrocalcinosis. Uh, but in addition, the patient has selective narrowing of the radial scaphoid articulation. This is not OA. It's not a place for OA. It's not inflammatory because an inflammatory arthritis is going to narrow this whole articulation. This is crystal disease. Here again, what's going on? Scapholuminate dissociation, selective narrowing of the radial scaphoid articulation. This is a slack wrist. And here, what eventually happens is the capitate moves down proximally. Okay, so radial scaphoid articulation, scapholuminate dissociation, proximal migration of the capitate. Now, what about other crystal diseases? Gout. The important thing to remember about gout are a couple of things. It can be anywhere. It doesn't even have to be at joints. First MTP is the most common. Um, it takes a long time to see radiographic changes. You have a patient that has their first attack of gout, the plain homes are going to be normal. Trust me. The hallmark sign, the buzzword, is overhanging edges. And here we have a patient with a tophus that's been there for years. It's eroding the underlying bone. Uh, and here you can see there's a you know, multiple bone erosions, big soft tissue tophi. Here's a magnified view of that same patient, uh, big time, long standing erosions. Like I said, gout can involve any joint. This is unusual, but we're getting erosions of this sacroiliac joint. This one's normal in a patient with gouty arthritis. Here's a patient with soft tissue swelling. Uh, you can see that here with a, sort of a little bit of an overhanging edge of gouty arthritis. Now, other crystal diseases, calcium hydroxyapatite, that's the crystal that we see in calcific tendinopathy. Um, there is an entity called the Milwaukee Shoulder that was described by Daniel McCarty in, in Milwaukee. Um, and that's calcific tendinopathy with a chronic rotator cuff tear. And what happens, or at least what's thought to happen, the calcium hydroxyapatite is deposited not only in the tendon, but also in the synovium, and it stimulates a proteolytic enzyme, and the patient eats his own rotator cuff. Um, this is a patient with calcific tendinopathy. You can see that calcification there. These are painful. Here, calcific tendinopathy, sort of amorphous, sort of chunky-looking calcification. Uh, and here's a patient with the Milwaukee shoulder, the chronic rotator cuff tear, the head's coming up. Here's another one, the head's coming up right, and there's some calcific tendinopathy. So it's something to be aware, an entity to be aware of. Now, let's talk about strange things, but they're not that strange. Actually, there was a patient that came in yesterday who, uh, it was a return patient, so I already knew it, who had multicenter reticular histocytosis. Um, it's a rare disease. Um, Interesting, it may be a pair of neoplastic. Usually these patients are frequently, they're worked up for occult neoplasm. But it has a characteristic distribution. It's symmetrical, like rheumatoid, but it is distal, like uh, psoriasis. Uh, so it's something you want to be aware of. It's a lumpy, bumpy disease. They have soft tissue lumps. Uh, if you look at this patient, a lot of wrist disease here. But look at this. This looks like sort of psoriasis, 
but it's a very symmetrical disease. Here's a, this is a patient that came into clinic yesterday to see if she was progressing. And again, she has a very symmetrical disease that's distal, um, so it's not going to be rheumatoid, and it's symmetrical, so it's not going to be psoriasis. Now, other things that we commonly see, as Marge uh, alluded to, DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal fibrosis, the criteria that we don't always follow, uh, three vertebral bodies, normal disc spaces, normal SI joints. Well, of course, I'll make the diagnosis even if I don't have SI joints, and I will sometimes make the diagnosis if I don't have three contiguous vertebral bodies, but this is a pretty good thing to, uh, to follow. Um, they get enthesopathy. Um, they also have an increased incidence of heterotomy bone formation, especially if they have a total hip. They get that myositis and syphagians. Um, it's associated with RA. It's called radish. I don't make this stuff up. And it's also associated with opal, which is ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. Here's a patient with classic DISH. Okay, you look at the apophyseal joints, they're normal. It doesn't look inflammatory. You look at the disc spaces, normal. It's not degenerative. They get these huge paravertebral ossifications. Uh, here's another patient with DISH. Now, this patient also has disc disease, you know, but degenerative change is common. This is clearly DISH here with normal disc spaces uh, and big, bulky uh, ossifications. And here's a patient with opal. Uh, they have ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. You can see it here. And these patients can have neurological symptoms, so it's not something uh, you want to miss. It's seen in 2% of the Japanese population. It may be autosomal dominant. Okay, let's talk at the end uh, as we're winding up about neuropathic joints. You don't want to miss these. Um, the five Ds of a neuropathic joint, destruction, debris, disorganization, density, distension. In other words, when you see a joint that's completely screwed up, think neuropathic, okay? And here's a shoulder. This patient's never had surgery. Uh, there's sharp angle fragmentation. The bones are not osteopenic. This patient doesn't have disuse osteoporosis because the patient doesn't have, doesn't have any pain. And that's a classic neuropathic shoulder. Here's an elbow. It's all screwed up but it's dense or relatively dense, fragmented, disorganized. Here's a patient that actually had um, uh, amyloid um, neuropathic joint, and this, sh this knee is completely uh, screwed up. Commonly, we see them in the foot because of diabetes. Here's one at Chopard's joint. Probably more commonly, we see them at the Lisfranc joint. This one's a little bit subtle. There's widening of, between the first and second uh, metatarsals. This one's a little bit more obvious with all this sclerosis at the Lisfranc joint. Don't forget they can occur in the spine, but they follow the same rules, fragmentation, normal mineralization. You know, it's completely screwed up, and here's the EMR on that patient. So our differential for neuropathic joints, diabetes is the most common thing we see, especially in the lower extremity. Um, and other things that we don't see very frequently, syphilis, although supposedly it's making a comeback, uh, spinal tumors, especially in the upper extremity. Uh, leprosy, well, we don't see it in Chicago that I know of. Uh, and congenital insensitivity to pain uh, is rare uh, in amyloid neuropathy. Now, in the last half a minute, uh, amyloid arthropathy, Marge mentioned this, and I just want to show you uh, what it looks like, because it's something to be aware of when you have uh, uh, an arthritis that's long-standing, usually after long years of dialysis, beta-2 microglobulin. They can present with carpal tunnel syndrome as they get this amyloid deposition. And this is sort of the classic finding that you see. Um, this patient's had a renal transplant, but you can see that there's all this sharp erosion uh, on both sides of the joint. So your differential in a patient like this with these sharp erosions would be an indolent infection such as TB, uh, perhaps pigmented villanodrocinovitis. Uh, but always be aware of this entity, especially if it's a patient that is, you know, it's a renal patient, that this patient could have uh, an amyloid joint disease. Okay, and I think we'll end there. Thank you very much.
Well, we'll start off. These are just going to be a kind of variety of unknowns, unknown cases, and uh, uh, they're going to be a mix of good boards cases and uh, some slightly more advanced cases as well. Let's we'll start off with a couple ant minis here. There's a 14 year old girl with foot pain. And here are the radiographs weight bearing view of the foot. And has anyone seen anything abnormal here? Yes, I heard a yes. Okay. Good, metatarsal head. Okay. Does anyone have any idea what this person might have? The name of this. Okay, I heard, I heard it somewhere out there. Okay, so there's flattening sclerosis of the second metatarsal head. We see slight widening of the second metatarsal phalangeal joint space. And this is a patient with Freiburg's disease. Sometimes it's called Freiburg's infraction. And it's an anterior metatarsalgia that involves the head, usually of the second metatarsal, but can also involve the third and fourth. It occurs during the growth spurt at puberty, mostly in girls. The pathogenesis is rather speculative. It's thought to be due to repetitive stress, leading to microfractures and eventually subchondrally vascular necrosis. And it's more common in patients with a long second metatarsal relative to the first metatarsal, and it may be related to wearing high-heeled shoes. Early on radiographs, you'll see sclerosis and flattening of the metatarsal head and widening of the joint space. Later on, you'll actually see narrowing of the joint space due to secondary osteoarthritis and perhaps fragmentation. Um, the treatment, if their clinician ever asks you, do I need to send this to an orthopedic surgeon? Well, it does require proper footwear, maybe a bar or a pad placed beneath the involved bone and limited activity for four to six weeks. With severe symptoms, the foot may be immobilized in a short leg walking cast for three to four weeks. Surgical indications are pretty rare. Uh, for example, if you fail conservative treatment, uh, they may remove the metatarsal head. Let's go on to another one here. This is case two, an adolescent with knee pain. I'll give you a close-up here. Another one to warm you up with. So this is medial side over here, this lateral side over here. Anyone see any abnormalities? Okay, good. I heard heard people say it. You see a lucency along the articular surface of the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle. It contains a little ovoid bone fragment here. And this is osteochondritis or osteochondrosis desiccans, a subchondral fracture. Again, the etiology is rather controversial. It's probably chronic injury. It occurs predominantly in adolescents and young adults. Uh, symptoms may be none or may be very vague. You can get mechanical symptoms, clicking and locking or swelling and pain aggravated by movement. Other sites you can see it in, you can see it in the lateral femoral condyle, but usually it's in the lateral aspect of the medial uh, femoral condyle, also in the Taylor dome and capitellum of the distal humerus. Radiographs early on may be completely normal. You may see a joint effusion, but eventually you'll get this radiolucent area, and after that, a little osteochondral body that's separated from the underlying bone. I'm putting a couple of these cases in here because I didn't have time to talk about them in my MRI of the knee talk, but it's important uh, to recognize these. In MRI, you can get a look for on the T2-weighted images, a little fluid signal cleft on the T2-weighted images along the line of demarcation that suggests f separation of the fragment from the underlying bone and therefore instability, and that's the main thing the orthopedic surgeon wants to know. Uh, some people advocate MR arthrography because sometimes the uh, high signal we see on T2-weighted images is due to granulation tissue. Usually we can separate the two. If it's really fluid signal intensity, it's going to be joint fluid. There are some things that can mimic this and there's a differential diagnosis. One can have an acute osteochondral fracture, uh, particularly the ones you see in the lateral femoral condyle. It's just kind of a bone bruise go bad, gone bad after an ACL tear. Uh, but here you see a curvilinear fracture line with the, uh, within the subchondral bone extending to the cartilaginous surface. So if you see that in the lateral femoral condyle, look for your ACL tear and look for your corresponding contusion in the, in the tibia. There's a little normal variant that occurs in, in, uh, in a younger age group uh, less than 10 years of age, and that'll occur in the posterior femoral condyle. It can be either medial or lateral, but it's actually more common laterally, and the overlying cartilage is going to be completely normal. Spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee or sonk uh, is an avascular necrosis that occurs in the weight bearing segment of the medial femoral condyle as opposed to the lateral aspect. The lateral aspect being over here, where you usually see OCDs, and this occurs more in the weight bearing aspect. This occurs in an older age group than your typical OCD, usually in the sixth and seventh decades. And I will diagnose it if I know the patient doesn't have any other predisposing factors that might lead to AVN. And if I see if it looks exactly like um, the uh, AVN that you might see in the femoral head. And if you know there's not uh, a history of steroids or anything else that might cause AVN, call it sunk. 
So here is a 20-year-old male, status post partial lateral meniscectomy and a recent fall. It's a little bit trickier. Here's a T2 weighted image, sagittal image. And here is a proton density, the same image. Anyone see any problems here? It's a little bit of a tricky case. Especially since we got the MRI before the plane film in this particular instance. Well, let's go over some of the findings here. First of all, you see on the T1, T2 weighted image, there's a hematocrit level in the joint. So I should tell you, you should always be concerned when you see that possibility that you might have a fracture somewhere. And believe it or not, I am showing you the fracture on this image. It's better seen on this image than the other one. Anyone have any ideas? Well, the fracture is actually right here. And if you follow the cortex of the patella all the way around, the one area where you don't see it is right here. And um, we, of course, suggested that they get plain films in this case. And sure enough, there's the avulsed superior patellar cortex. And I put this in here to remind me to tell the residents to always make sure. We didn't really talk about the extensor mechanism in the, in the knee lecture. Because you're so intent on looking at the ACL, making sure it's okay, and the menisci, making sure they're okay, that you completely see that there's a full thick, and forget to see that there's a full thickness quadriceps tendon tear. Also remember what the quadriceps tendon or the quadriceps muscles composed of the vastus medialis, vastus intermedius, vastus lateralis, and rectus femoris. And the extensor mechanism consists of the quadriceps patella, the infrapatellar tendon, and the anterior tibial tubercle. Injuries occur with sudden and severe contraction of the quadriceps while the knee is flexed. It's common in high jumpers and basketball players and results in either tearing of the quadriceps or infrapatellar tendons, an avulsion fracture of the tendinous insertion, as we just saw, <clears throat> excuse me, or a transverse fracture of the patella, although this is relatively rare with this mechanism. Um, Marge mentioned quadriceps tendon tears. They're more, actually more likely to occur in the elderly than in kids, and they often occur as the end result of repetitive microtrauma secondary to weakening uh, due to underlying conditions. Again, gout, diabetes, hyperparathyroidism, certainly, and collagen vascular disease. And here you can see the disrupted quadriceps tendon. Patellar tendon tears are more likely to occur in children and adolescents, often due to a direct trauma to the proximal tibia or, a, again, a hyperflexion injury. Very common boards type case they'll show you is the patella alta here. Um, then you can, if you are so inclined, get the MRI to really uh, evaluate the tendon itself and uh, see how, how far apart they are. I like this case. This is a 16-year-old girl with left forearm pain. Here is the left forearm. Do you see any abnormalities here? Looks like there's something going on here in the ulna. We'll take a little, another look at it on another view. Some cortical thickening here. A little lucency here. Any ideas what this might be? Okay, I heard some people say osteoid osteoma. That was actually, this patient was referred to our orthopedic oncology clinic with a diagnosis of osteoid osteoma. But if you really look carefully, of this lucency. It's kind of a linear lucency, isn't it? And the patient denied the classic symptoms of osteoid osteoma, which are, as Larry pointed out, pain is typically worse at night, relieved by aspirin. Uh, so you have to kind of wonder what this is. And it turns out this patient was a baton twirler and who had been asked to participate in the Rose Bowl parade and been practicing really, really extensively recently. So it turns out this was a stress fracture of the ulna and the patient's symptoms improved markedly following cessation of baton twirling. Now, we don't see stress fractures of the upper extremity all that commonly compared to the lower extremity, at least, uh, because there's just a general lack of weight-bearing activities that are going to lead to such stress fractures. But the exceptions are athletes who exert substantial repetitive forces on the bones of the upper extremities, be it gymnastics, uh, tennis players, baseball players, weightlifters, bowling. And so reported ulnar stress fractures, specifically ulnar stress fractures, have been described in tennis players, softball players, weightlifters, table tennis players, bowling, elite bobsledding, in particular a brakeman of the bobsled, and competitive polo. Here's another case I really like. Uh, here's a 14-year-old boy with knee pain who presents to our orthopedic oncology clinic with an outside MRI study. And this is what he presents with. 
There's our T1 weighted image. So, and this, this is in mean, the whole image right here, essentially. Anyone see anything abnormal here? How about someone just shouts out the location of the abnormality? Yeah, diapocele, okay, fair enough. Here it is on T1 weighted image. Here's on T, T2 weighted image, kind of heterogeneous here. Just st stare at this picture for a little while here. See if anyone can pick out anything else here. Okay. Well, any ideas based on what we're seeing here? This is a child, has a eccentric or cortically based lesion. Anyone want to do anything in particular to evaluate this further? Excellent. Okay, plane films. Um, so here you go. Here's your plane film. There it is. Again, it's a young kid. Any any ideas? NOF. Okay, I think that's a great great uh, great thought here. And um, what you have is an elongated, eccentric, cortically based, low signal intensity lesion, the distal diaphysis of the femur. On T2 weighted images, the lesion is heterogeneous, has both low and high signal intensity components. I blew it up a little bit here. It has a low signal intensity border, which corresponds to sclerosis that you'll see on radiograph. It implies you have a benign lesion here. And on radiographs, you have both lucent and sclerotic components in this lesion. I mean, this is a, this is a non ossifying fibroma. It occurs commonly in children, especially in the lower extremity. It's eccentric. It's cortically based within the metaphysis or the diaphysis of a long bone. And the thing about these is how they will appear will de de depend on the maturity of the lesion. Early on, they might be completely loosened, although they'll have a sclerotic rim. In the in intermediate or healing stage, they're going to have both loosened and sclerotic components, as in this case. And the late stage, uh, they'll be just completely sclerotic and eventually disappear. Uh, differential diagnosis, if you saw something like this in the tibia, you might consider adamantinoma or ossifying fibroma. Chondromyxoid fibromas can occasionally look like non-ossifying fibromas, but usually they have a much more uh, bubbly appearance with bulging of the cortex. Uh, the important thing to remember, these are asymptomatic unless fractured. On MRI, you can see a low signal intensity border corresponding to that sclerotic rim on radiographs. Earlier in the development, you'll see high signal intensity on T2-weighted images when the lesion is loosened on radiographs, but again, gradually they demonstrate heterogeneous low signal intensity on T2-weighted images as they heal and sclerose. So here is what it looked like on the um, axial views. You can see it is a cortically-based lesion. Um, so I've already told you we have still a problem here. This patient has knee pain, and non-ossifying fibromas don't give you knee pain, unless they're fractured. So. Any other thoughts? Oh, okay. Maybe we should take a look at the scout images here. Something doesn't look quite right in this tibia. And in fact, if you go back to this original T2-weighted image I showed you, here's that lesion. Something's going on in the tibia down here. There's way too much edema down there. And if you really, really imagine, and I'll blow it up for you here, maybe there's something right there. Who knows? Let's take a better look, see if we can get a slightly better picture. Well, that's not much better. But there's something there. Why don't we get an MRI? Oh, yeah, there's definitely something there. Okay. So you have on this T1-weighted image, you see a lesion there in the tibia. Here is on T2-weighted images. So again, young kid, epiphyseal lesion. What are we thinking about here? Good. Chondroblastoma. So radiograph shows a little sclerotic ring, very tough to see in the uh, proximal tibial epiphysis surrounding a mixed sclerotic and lucent lesion. On T1-weighted images, you have an intermediate to low signal intensity lesion in the proximal tibial epiphysis with surrounding edema, quite a bit of surrounding edema. Same thing on the T2-weighted image. Notice how heterogeneous it is. There is some low signal intensity within the lesion, but a lot of edema that even extends into the metaphysis. So Larry's talked about chondroblastoma. It's uncommon benign bone tumor. 90% of them occur in, in uh, kids and very young adults, and greater than 95% of them will begin in the epiphysis, but may extend into the metaphysis. On T2-weighted images, they can be of quite variable signal intensity. It's thought to be that these foci of hypo-intensity correlate with the immature chondroid matrix or calcification or even hemosiderin. And what can be really scary is the amount of adjacent edema you have with these chondroblastomas. It can really extend into the metaphysis and give it a much more um, uh, ominous look. In kids, the main differential diagnosis, I think, is going to be a Brody's ab uh, abscess or some sort of infection. Usually, it's less well-defined. You might have joint 
inflammatory changes as well. There are a bunch of uh, you know, EGA, ABC, chondromalacyl fibroma, primary bone sarcomas. They can very, very rarely occur solely in the epiphysis, um, but uh, usually they're, they're not. In adults, uh, the one thing to consider if you see something like this in an adult, as Larry mentioned before, is the rare variant of chondrosarcoma called a clear cell chondrosarcoma. It looks identical to a chondroblastoma. A uh, giant cell tumor, again, begins in the metaphysis and usually works its way into the epiphysis, and it's usually larger with no matrix and no sclerotic margins in most cases. And intraosteous ganglia will be a fluid signal intensity on MRI <clears throat> without any surrounding edema. So now we have a 60-year-old patient with a slowly enlarging, painless arm mass. Here is, here are two views of the elbow. Anybody see anything here? What's that? Sorry. Okay, so you're, someone's looking at this up here. Looks like fat density here. So what do you think this is going to be? Okay, heard someone say lipoma. So yeah, there's a large mass of fat density anterior to the distal humerus. Maybe you can imagine some septations in there, but I wouldn't necessarily uh, claim that on a plain film. So of course, what should we get to look for? Soft tissue tumors? Let's get an MRI. So here it is. What do we think? Still a lipoma? Could it be something else? Well, the problem here that we're dealing with is that it's not completely fatty signal intensity, all right? It's predominantly fat, but it's not completely fat. You see some septations of varying sizes. You see some areas that are non-adipose. I mean, there's definitely fat intermixed in there, but there, there are areas that are non-adipose signal. And so whenever you see this, you're going to be hard-pressed to call this a simple lipoma. And in fact, this was a well-differentiated liposarcoma. I want to talk for a few minutes about these liposarcomas because I think that's important. We see, we see lipomas all the time. And uh, I, I want to talk about when you might want to call, consider something as a liposarcoma. Well, there are four types of liposarcomas. There are well-differentiated liposarcomas, mixoid, pleomorphic, and dedifferentiated. There's also a mixed type, which is basically just a combination of these. We're not going to talk about that. Um, the well-differentiated liposarcoma is the most common subtype. It may resemble lipoma grossly, but it's a low-grade tumor although it has no propensity to metastasize in and of itself, and therefore it's treated with marginal excision. Now, unfortunately, there's some inconsistent terminology here. There's well-differentiated liposarcoma and atypical lipoma, which are essentially the same thing pathologically. But in 1979, a guy named Evans argued that the subcutaneous and intramuscular tumors that have the histologic appearance of a well-differentiated liposarcoma should actually be designated as atypical lipomas because they do not constitute a sufficient danger to life to be considered a sarcoma, even though pathologically they are. The uh, New World Health Organization classification of tumors recommends that we use the term well-differentiated liposarcoma for lesions located at sites in which a wide, wide surgical margin can't be obtained, like the retroperitoneum or the mediastinum. Now, on MRI, these lesions contain predominantly fat with linear, swirled, or nodular non-adipose areas. So if you see that, you have to consider the fact that it might be a well-differentiated liposarcoma, particularly if the nodular, excuse me, the septa are nodular, they're thick, or you see a lot of enhancement following um, gadolinium administration. This is a fairly scary case of a T1-weighted image. You see this big, fatty mass back here, and it really does look predominantly fatty. A little bit of an area down here, I don't know, I'd probably just say maybe it's a little bit of infarcted lipoma or something. Here's the T2-weighted image with fat saturation. And again, it's predominantly fatty. There's sort of this vague area down here with uh, some increased signal intensity. Yeah, maybe it's just incomplete fat saturation. But then here's the T1-weighted image with fat saturation gadolinium. You see there's a fair amount of enhancement there. And this, in fact, was another well-differentiated liposarcoma. Um, I want to talk about a couple of these other ones here, and then we'll talk about some lipoma variants. A D-differentiated liposarcoma is a bimorphic neoplasm in which you get a histologically different high-grade sarcoma, usually an MFH or a fibrosarcoma, that arises in association with a well-differentiated liposarcoma. And the risk of D-differentiation is estimated at about 15% for retroperitoneal lesions and about 5% for extremity tumors. And they're treated much more aggressively than your well-differentiated liposarcoma. 
they're treated with radical wide resection and chemotherapy and radiation. So this is where you have the problem with your well-differentiated liposarcomas, that it might de-differentiate, and then those are bad tumors to have. On MRI, you're going to see features that look like a well-differentiated liposarcoma, but you'll have this additional dominant nodular focus that's completely non-lipomatous tissue. And eventually, this may get so big that you'll only get like less than 25% fat on imaging. Here it is on a T2-weighted image, again, high signal intensity within this fatty tumor. And here it is on a T1-weighted image showing an enhancement. Mixoid liposarcoma is an intermediate-grade tumor with metastatic potential, often to the pleural or peritoneal surfaces. They may have very nonspecific imaging characteristics, and a lot of liposarcomas do. They just don't, you can't distinguish them from other tumors. Uh, some of them show some smaller areas of fat, but with the mixoid variety, it's usually less than 25% of the tumor volume. Uh, sometimes, and this is the really scary part, is they can sort of simulate a cyst. And this is in about less than a quarter of the cases, but here's a T1-weighted image. On T2, it really looks like a cyst. The problem is here that it enhances not like a cyst. And this was a mixoid liposarcoma. And finally, pleomorphic liposarcoma is a high-grade malignancy that behaves aggressively and is treated aggressively with radical wide resection, chemotherapy, and radiation. These are usually nonspecific. Uh, you may have a little bit of fat. You can barely see within there, but uh, for the most part, they're very nonspecific tumors and look like every other large sarcoma. Sometimes a lipoma just doesn't look like a lipoma, and that's, that's the problem that we have. I mean, this is a tumor here with some fatty components. There's no way you could say this wasn't some sort of liposarcoma, but there are a bunch of lipoma variants, and this as was read out pathologically as an intramuscular lipoma with degenerative changes. Sometimes these can infarct or fibrose and be very, very problematic. And there are a bunch of benign lipoma variants. I'm going to show you a few cases of them, but we won't get through all of them.